morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we finish up our series on populations. Last topic we've got to talk about is risk analysis. So, like always, let me get you some objectives, and we'll get going. By this end of, end of sorry, words are hard. By the end of this video, two things that I need you to know. First one, discuss each of the steps of risk analysis. That's where we're going to spend most of our time today. And compare and contrast the global standards for risk assessment. So before we jump into the meat of our video today, we've got to talk about environmental hazards, which is anything in our environment that can cause harm. Now, on a daily basis, we are exposed to hundreds of things that can cause harm. Everything from the sun, which could cause cancer, to our drinking water, which could be polluted, to the air we breathe, could have particulate pollution in it. So every day we are exposed to a ton of hazards. Now, as we are exposed to hazards, every one of us kind of goes through an individual um, risk assessment process, which basically is deciding how much risk we are able or willing to deal with. Um, but corporate corporations and governments go through the same process. So let me walk you through the steps of the risk assessment and management process. So first thing, the steps of risk assessment, there are three of them. They are assessment, acceptance, and management. And we're going to go through each of those individually. I'm going to give you some examples along the way. So the first step of the risk process would be assessment. And in the assessment phase, there's a couple things that happen. The first thing is you identify the potential harm, and then you determine the potential magnitude. So you define what is the thing that could potentially do damage, and you determine how much damage it could actually do. Now, in doing this, there's two ways that the damage is assessed and measured. First one is qualitative, which is basically a judgment call. So we do this on a daily basis all the time. You have the opportunity to, let's say, walk down a busy street or ride in a car. You perceive riding in a car to be more safe, so you decide that you're going to ride in a car. That would be a qualitative judgment call. It is based on a perception. It's not based on numbers or anything like that. Um, an example of a qualitative assessment of risk would be the decision to drive or fly. There are lots of people around the world who are terrified of flying because they fear that the plane is going to crash and that they're going to die. So given the option, they will always take a plane or a, sorry, they will always take a train or a car rather than flying because their perception, their qualitative assessment is that a train or a car is actually a safer way to travel than flying. Now, here's some actual stats for you. And we've got these stats because insurance people and governments and everybody else keeps track of who dies and how people die. And these are your actual chances of dying from specific things in America in any given year. So if you look at these things, you can see that the one thing that we should all be worried about is heart disease because there's a one in five chance that you will die from heart disease. So this means that risk factors for heart disease like smoking, being overweight, liking exercise should scare you a lot more than, say, an airplane accident. You have a 1 in 5,051 chance of dying from an airplane accident. So this means that your chances of dying from heart disease are a thousand times greater than they are from dying in an airplane accident. And then some of the other big ones, you got cancer, you got stroke, and then you got a car accident. Um, if you look down through here, there's a lot of really interesting things that are tracked, but this graph is just intended to show that the things that we perceive to be very dangerous, such as airplane accidents aren't nearly as dangerous as the things that we do not worry all that much about. So because of the perception problem, the fact that we think things are more dangerous than they actually are, people who are doing risk assessment need to do quantitative assessment, which is actually putting numbers to something to figure out how dangerous is this thing actually. Um, and the equation that you would use to do that is risk is equal to the probability of exposure, so how likely are you to be exposed to a thing, times the probability of harm. And here's a quick example of you. If you want to compare flying in an airplane with eating peanut butter. Now, I know you say eating peanut butter. There's no risk in eating peanut butter. Uh, peanut butter contains very, very small trace amounts of a fungus that has been shown to cause cancer. So eaten enough, it's possible that you could develop cancer from eating peanut butter, though you're not going to. So if you want to compare those two, let's go with the risk for flying first. So the risk of flying is equal to the probability of exposure. Let's say that you, I don't know, fly once or twice per year, and you fly, I don't know, 1,500, 2,000 miles. 
times probability of harm. Now, for a plane wreck, probability of harm is near 100%. You are probably going to die if you are in a plane wreck. So there is prob there is a very low probability of being exposed to a plane wreck, but you will have a high probability of harm if your plane does wreck. Now let's do that for peanut butter. The risk of dying from eating peanut butter, your probability of exposure is probably 100% unless you're allergic to peanuts, but your probability of harm is very, very low. So if you actually run the stats on that, your chance of dying in a plane wreck is about one in a million. Your chance of dying from eating too much peanut butter is also about one in a million. So that would be quantitative assessment. That's actually putting numbers to the things that we perceive to be dangerous. Another real world example of this would be the Hudson River. Now, Hudson River had historically a lot of manufacturing a lot on it, and those manufacturing companies released PCBs into the water. It's a class of endocrine disruptors that have been caused to or have been linked to all of the damages that we talked about in our toxicology video, also um, have been linked to liver and kidney damage. And so for the Hudson River, officials had to figure out, all right, how much are we worried about people being exposed to these toxins that are in the river? And they decided, or they kind of went through the whole like quantitative analysis process, and they found that, all right, a person that lives in the area is very unlikely to be exposed to PCBs in the air. They are fairly unlikely to be exposed to PCBs in the actual water in the Hudson River. However, people are likely to be exposed to fish that have lived in the Hudson. Now the fish that have lived in the Hudson, obviously they're going to absorb all those PCBs. So if you eat the fish, you get the PCBs. So what the government decided to do is to set up a catch and release only fishing policy on the Hudson River, meaning that people can't eat the fish that come out of the river. So they kind of looked at that risk. They said, all right, the best way that we can keep people safe is to keep them from eating the fish. So that's what they decided to do. The next step of our process is going to be risk assessment, which is never an easy task. So we go through the whole assessment process. We figure out, all right, here's the thing that is dangerous. This is how dangerous it is. Now, are we willing to accept that risk? Every time you make a decision, you go through risk acceptance. So let's say you decide to have a drink. You have uh, decided to accept whatever risk comes along with that, whether it is you know being harmed in a drunk driving accident or getting in trouble or whatever. That's a risk that you have chosen to accept. Now, this is always difficult because people's viewpoints and worldviews get in the way, and everybody stands on different places when it comes to certain risks. So let's say you're an environmentalist. You're going to fall on the side of protecting the environment and people at all costs. If you are more worried about business concerns, you're probably not going to be as worried about the uh, human or environmental cost, you're worried about business. So obviously there's going to be a lot of problem in this risk acceptance phase. And once all the negotiating is done and the acceptable risk has been decided on, the government or the organization has decided they're going to move forward. The last step they got to go through is risk management. And the risk management is actually dealing with the risk. And this is usually left to local regulators, state regulators, government regulators, legislators. Um, risk management usually looks like putting laws and regulations into place to say, all right, this is or is not acceptable. Here are the rules around the use of this chemical or this activity. So the management phase usually involves a lot of rules and regulations. A couple things to finish up with. Um, I want to give you an example of, I don't know, where things kind of get problematic when it comes to regulation being left to government officials and whatnot. Um, Arsenic is a substance that is occasionally found in water. Um, it can be released from the mining process, and in some places it actually just occurs naturally in water. problem with arsenic is it's a pretty deadly heavy metal. Um, it has been shown to cause cancer. The hands right there on the side are hands of a person who has arsenic poisoning. So forever the government knew and scientific researchers knew that a drinking water concentration of arsenic well, they, sorry, let me back that up. They knew that a concentration of arsenic that is 50 micrograms per liter of water is enough to cause cancer. So that was the known kind of, I won't say LD50 because it wasn't enough to kill you, but that was at least enough to cause potential harm or, you know, probably will cause harm. And forever, the safe uh, level of arsenic in drinking water was set to be at 50 micrograms per liter. So the uh, rules for arsenic levels in water were set at a level that was enough to cause people harm. Um, in 1999, there was a push to get the regulation changed to 10 
micrograms per liter, which is obviously a much safer level. It's not likely to do people harm. But when this legislation was proposed, mining companies and local um, municipalities said, we can't do this. It's going to be too expensive for us to change our processes such that we can get down to 10 micrograms per liter. So they lobbied against the government. Government gave in. The government said, all right, we are going to keep the levels right here at 50. Even though this is the level that we know causes harm, the people who give us cash and who lobby us have convinced us to stay at 50 grams. There was then a study that came out not too much later that showed concentrations as low as 5 microliters per gram can cause significant damage. With this new information, the government finally uh, stepped up and said, all right, we are going to change the regulation, I believe, to 10 microliters per gram. So because of the influence of money and business and politics and all that messiness, often getting the legislation process done and setting things at a level that is safe for humans is a very difficult thing to do, which leads nicely into this idea of standards of risk. Depending on where you are in the world, your government is going to have a different uh, method or perspective when it comes to dealing with risk. In America, we operate on a model called the innocent until proven guilty model. This model basically is tilted towards innovation, develop of new products, and the release of new products. So this is how the process basically works. First thing you do is research and development. So you've got people in a lab working. Maybe they are making some pharmaceutical. Maybe they're making some industrial chemical. Either way, they go through and they develop this new thing. Now, the blue bottle is going to represent a good and safe chemical. This is one that is dangerous. So they release this chemical. After they release it, there is limited or no pre-market testing. So they don't test it very much. They just develop this chemical and then they release it onto the, you know, onto the consumer. So at this point, these products are available to the consumer. If it's a good product, fine, no problems. If it's a bad product, oh well, it's out there in the, pro in the public. After it's been released, then we do post-market testing and kind of see what's going on. If it's a safe chemical, sweet keeps going it is regulated rules are put around it and it is a safe consumer product if it is unsafe then it's going to go back to the drawing board be recalled whatever is coming off of the market so in the innocent until proven guilty model things are released and they're basically left out there until they are shown to be dangerous now in the european union it is completely different you still have the industrial research and development phase you then have your safe products that are tested. Also, the unsafe products are tested. So in this model, things are extensively tested before they are released onto the market. If in this testing process, a chemical is found to be safe, then it is you know, released to the public and it becomes a good on the consumer market. However, if it is found to be unsafe, it never makes it to the market. So the difference is in this model, Things are released very quickly. It favors innovation, but a lot of bad uh, products get out onto the market. This is why you have drug commercials that have got all of the millions of side effects as part of the commercial. In the European Union, innovation may not happen as quickly, but you also don't get products released that are likely to do harm to people. And we're going to wrap up with this last slide of the day because in environmental science, you always need to know regulation that goes along with things. So as we're talking about managing the use of chemicals, a couple that you need to know. You need to know the Stockholm Convention. This was a big conference that took place in Stockholm, Sweden in 2001. During this convention, there were 12 industrial chemicals that were banned globally, um, or at least in countries that agreed to this convention. Some of the chemicals that were banned included PCBs and DDT. Um, all of the chemicals that were banned were found to be endocrine disruptors. And then in 2009, there were nine other chemicals that were added to the Stockholm Convention. And then in the European Union, you have got the REACH protocol which is a protocol that is basically based around the precautionary principles. So it dictates that any chemical that comes to market or has been on the market in Europe has to go through a really extensive testing process before it is actually released to the public. And with that, I think we are done with populations. Um, that was the risk assessment um, phases, protocol, whatever you want to call it. I would recommend going back and looking at it, make sure that you are familiar with each of the stages. Make sure you know this legislation. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.